Okay, well, thank you all so much for joining us today. I see we have more people joining. So I'll just go ahead and start with some brief introductory remarks. Um, so thank you, yes, for joining us for today's webinar, which is titled Mosul After ISIS, Political and Social Dynamics in Uncertain Times. Uh, my name is Sarah Ann Rennick. I'm the Deputy Director of the Arab Reform Initiative. And today's uh, webinar is being co-hosted with our partners, uh, IREMO, the Institute for Research and Studies on the Mediterranean and the Middle East. Um, and today's discussion is actually coming from a research project we are currently undertaking, a broad research project in partnership with IREMO on uh, youth in context of conflict and post-conflict. Uh, it's a project that's exploring in a lot of different uh, conflict zones, uh, what happens for youth in terms of their self-construction, the way they project themselves, the strategies they undertake, both politically and economically, um, when they come into adulthood in a context of conflict and in the post-conflict phase. And one of the cases we're looking at with IREMO uh, is on Mosul and how youth have been uh, impacted in terms of their um, economic trajectories and livelihood trajectories, but also in terms of their political agency and their um, interest in collective action and their political values in both uh, under the, the period of um, Islamic State rule and in this post-IS period. And we have found that the research results, which are looking both at youth kind of holistically, but also breaking it down in terms of uh, their gender identities, sectarian identities, ethnic identities, that the opportunities and constraints obviously change under these shifting contexts, these shifting political configurations and social configurations, uh, but also that the, the results are somewhat surprising. Um, having discussions with, uh, with our partners, we have been, we've been surprised by some of the results and thought it might be interesting interesting to actually have a much broader discussion uh, looking at these shifting political dynamics and social dynamics um, that are occurring in this post-ISIS period in Mosul and in Nineveh more generally, and also how this is affecting different groups, and especially groups who were particularly marginalized under the rule of Islamic State, uh, for example, um, different minority groups, but also youth and others, and how this is affecting them in terms of their political mobilization, their political agency, discourses of rights uh, and their identity construction. Uh, so for today's event, um, I'm very lucky to be joined by four um, researchers and activists working in this field um, and mausolites themselves. Uh, so very, very um, in-depth expertise on this subject. Um, we'll be hearing today from uh, Omar Mohammed, who is a lecturer at Sciences Po and a PhD candidate at OHSS. He's also the founder of Mosul Eye. Uh, from Rasha Alakidi, who is a senior analyst and program head of human security unit at the New Lines Institute. From Adel Bakawan, who is director of Soci the Sociology Center at Soran University and the director of research at IREMU. Uh, and from Miriam Puttick, who is the head of Middle East and North Africa programs at the Ceasefire Center for Civilian Rights. Uh, just as a brief matter of sort of housekeeping for today's discussion, uh, first, if I think everyone knows, but we, this discussion is going to be in both French and English, and we do have simultaneous interpretation available for those joining us on Zoom. Uh, we will also have recordings afterward available both in French and in English. Uh, we will have each speaker will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we will open the floor for discussion. Uh, for the discussion for questions, we're asking that people type their questions in the chat section on Zoom or in the comment section on Facebook, and those will be uh, transmitted to us. Uh, and we will have about 90 minutes for today's, uh, for today's uh, webinar. Uh, so I think I will go ahead now and pass the floor on to our first speaker, to Omar, um, and we will enter the discussion. So Omar, please. Thank you, Sarah, for inviting me to this discussion. Uh, it's always very important to keep talking about Mosul because for many people, they think that the war is over. It might be over for uh, the military, for the uh, state, for even the international coalition. But the war is never over for the people who have been affected directly by uh, uh, either pre-2014 or po po post-2014. And I still 
uh, don't know if we are able to call it post war because because we are still in the consequences of this uh, the trauma that have been uh, created as a result of the uh, destruction of the cultural identity of the people the uh, uh, the sense of belonging to uh, uh, a national state in iraq has been heavily damaged uh, um, the way the city uh, see itself within uh, the largest border of Iraq as a national state, it's still also in question. Um, just yesterday, I've been listening to um, an interview with uh, uh, Cardinal Luis Rafael Sacco, and the interview was uh, conducted just a few days after the Christian were deported from Mosul. And he would mention a sentence that still, it's a fact today that Nineveh or Mosul is in fact have already been divided. It's uh, uh, administratively uh, uh, known as Nineveh, but we are currently dealing with completely uh, fractured communities. We have Sinjar living on its own. We have Nineveh plains. We have uh, uh, Western Nineveh. We have now uh, the 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 uh, governorate of Nineveh was completely minimized into a small town, which is the old city of Mosul, or the east and uh, left side of the city. And this is this has become the uh, uh, context in the mainstream that whenever you hear someone speaking about uh, Mosul, you think that they are speaking about all the uh, governorate, but it, in fact, most of the discussion have been put on the perception of the city. What geographical area are we speaking about? Are we speaking only about the oldest part of the city, which is only a tiny part of, 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 of Mosul? Are we speaking about the west uh, side? Are we speaking about the east side? Uh, it's, it's a very confusing uh, thing, but at the same time, a very dangerous uh, uh, thing to uh, 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 to process without uh, uh, paying more attention to it because it will have more damage in the future. But regardless, there has been, uh, uh, after the uh, fall of Daesh in Mosul, there has been a massive uh, youth movement in the city that wanted to reclaim the narrative of the city. Now, the question why they are trying to reclaim the narrative is because of the a pressure the city of Mosul have been put under since the fall of the city in 2014 uh, uh, and its occupation uh, by Daesh. That pressure was the collective guilt is what's been like known as the collective guilt, the what they call it, the collective responsibility that all the people of Mosul and again, uh, Sarah, you probably know very well how dangerous the uh, uh, concepts are and the language. And whenever we hear the word of the collective responsibility of the people of Mosul, we are not referring to everyone in the city. We are referring to only one group, and that is the Sunni Muslims of the city of Mosul or the Sunni Arabs. Uh, 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 there is a pressure to lead the city toward accepting the, what they call it, collective responsibility of what happened. Uh, they connect this to the 2013, uh, uh, for example, 2013 uh, protest for the people to call for their basic rights, which was hijacked by the terrorists and by the political uh, corruption in Iraq. And they always uh, lead toward, yes, you have been protesting and this protest led to the disaster of Daesh, therefore, you have to take the responsibility, which is part of its consequences currently. When we speak about, uh, is there a political life in Mosul? This answer simply is no, because even when it comes to a protest, even when it comes to the recent protest in Baghdad and in the uh, rest of Iraq, uh, the people of Mosul hesitate to in fact, uh, even speak about this protest because they know that if they speak about the protest, it will take them back to the 
2013 moment, therefore, to 2014. Uh, this is one of the consequences why there is no political life and why Mosul might not have a healthy political life in the uh, uh, coming future. Second is, despite the uh, 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 brave and creative activities the youth are doing in Mosul, it is in fact uh, a very fragile uh, movement that uh, uh, in somehow being hijacked and manipulated by two lines of political uh, 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 space in, in, in Iraq. One is controlled by the uh, political class in Ambar, for example, which is led by the uh, speaker of the parliament, Halbusi, who is, you can see, uh, you can see his uh, 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 propaganda everywhere in Mosul. You can see, you can trace back his money everywhere, everyone, everywhere in Mosul. And the other one is the uh, Iran-backed uh, militias who have almost the final say on the political life in Mosul. And therefore, those young people are trying to find their own way to create a healthy life. And that's why, while it's very a positive movement, because they are working on the reconstruction of the city, they are working on creating an open space for themselves, it's very important. But because it doesn't have any political affiliation, any uh, uh, political imagination, if I would say. I mean, they don't have any plan for uh, contributing to the political life to put Mosul back on the track to be not just a positive, but an effective contributor to the overall politics of Iraq. In, in somehow, uh, uh, it's no more a city that is actually uh, functioning politically or that it has any kind of uh, 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 political weight in uh, uh, the center of government of uh, Iraq. And that's why when people say the war is over, in fact, it is not, it is still ongoing. And the scenario that is waiting for uh, Mosul is uh, in fact, uh, uh, I mean, I'm not saying this just as a historian who who has to be who have to be uh, pessimistic. I have to be pessimistic because I know how history works, but the reality on the ground in Mosul is very worrying and concerning. Not to mention that just recently, the uh, uh, context of uh, the reintegration of the uh, uh, ISIS uh, perceived ISIS affiliate uh, families and how. Uh, 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 this kind of rejection to the families, despite that those families were also victims of Daesh, but because the city has been put in this kind of to prove innocence, that it's your burden to prove innocence. As a Mosley, you have to prove yourself that you have never done anything to support Daesh, that you have never, that your silence during the time of Daesh is not a crime, that you have to prove many things to the ruling uh, 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 political parties in Iraq and to the ruling power, which is in uh, somehow the Iran uh, uh, controlled and backed militias. And this burden is not going to be the same in the coming years. The people at one point will get tired of, of like, I am, I am tired of saying, telling you I am not Daesh. I didn't support Daesh. I, I'm saying this as an individual, but when we look at it collectively, you would see a very uh, concerning uh, uh, reality. Uh, so, I mean, this is, this is uh, uh, probably, Russia will probably uh, go deeper into this and to see how uh, 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 this works with 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 the with the uh, uh, with the Iraqi uh, uh, national borders with the Iraqi national identity because the question of the national identity is still not being properly addressed in Iraq. Thank you. Thank you very much, Omar, and thank you 
thank you in particular for for you know framing it this way that we're not really we can't really talk about a post conflict period at this point and highlighting this these fractures all these different fractures the political the identity fractures the social space the geographic space uh, and the impact of those different fractures and uh, acting as parameters for people's um, the way they can reconstruct their lives and their both individual and collective agency um, I think we'll now hear from Rasha. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to the Arab Initiative Reform for the invitation. Um, I'm going to start just building up on what Omar uh, spoke about. So as um, Mosul and the Sunni provinces in, in North and uh, West Iraq began falling to ISIS collectively, continuously, um, a narrative immediately of, of shame and slandering was created, and, and us versus them was really stagnated and what that had been stagnated for so long, at least at such a popular level, was stoked once again. And following the formation of the, the umbrella of militias that entered um, soon after to the battlefields, and by 2017, a narrative was created that I don't think at the time, I don't believe it was very popular in, in Iraq in general, but it was there, it was really pushed in the media. It was pushed by research centers, by experts and analysts who claim to be um, the, the center front of, of Iraqi expertise, which is that we, meaning the, the PMF, the Iraqi army, in other words, Shia majority, um, have some sort of, have, have a favor, have done favor for, for, for the Sunni people specifically of Muslims. So they are forever, the Muslims of Muslims are forever in debt to, to this, to the majority. That narrative of, of us having this kind of, of Muslims having to be grateful to the other um, really created the, this, this new reality in the city. And it has impacted political life and also activism amongst youth. It's very hard to become, as Omar was saying, to being from Muslim when you have to offer and to talk about anything, even just basic um, analysis, when you have to offer your credentials and you have to start by proving your innocence before you're even allowed an opportunity to speak. And Omar can um, confirm this, even just breaking into the research and analyst scene on a global scale, whether in, in the United States or in Europe is extremely hard if you are from Muslim because there's an immediate rejection of this. So I'm very grateful to have a platform and to be invited to speak today because that does not happen all the time. Um, the, the narrative is very much hijacked and you have people not from the city who have been here for maybe sometime in the 70s or 80s for a few years claiming to be experts on it, missing out on so much of the context. When we go back to the narrative of us versus them and we being, you know, having grad, most likely being rather grateful for the others for liberating them. Um, that has been the dominative narrative. And for activism, there was hope that this might be different. So when the protest movement began in Baghdad, and it was a grassroots, very spontaneous movements that were demanding basic rights, but it was specifically Baghdad and the South. And most of it was not even included in the narrative. Uh, we did not hear any calls for rebuilding the city that had been destructed completely, uh, the west side at least of the city. We did not hear any calls from protesters to rehabilitate homes and areas so people and IDPs can return to the city. The same also applies for areas like Samarra, applies for areas like Anbar. There were no calls, and these are not politicians, this is the population. So you feel that Mosul has been dropped off of the narrative, and mentioning this, bringing it up, there's almost a, an answer that's ready, which is, well, you brought the destruction on yourself, as Omar was saying, the collective responsibility. This is, this is extremely dangerous because most of it is at a crossroads, um, geographically, socially, and politically, with no political life to direct the youth and, and no role model there also that is from the city to direct them. You have collective anger that will begin as a response in several years. I don't think it's, I don't believe that ISIS will be able to make a comeback in these circumstances because, uh, because of the ISIS experience. It, it was traumatizing enough. It's not something 
anyone from Mosul wants to go through again, despite sleeper cells still being here and there. They're, they've been struggling with new recruitment. So that's not, that's not gonna, that's probably not a possible reality in the future. But because of where Mosul is and because of the KRG in the north, increasing Turkey influence, this is a leeway for intervention from other foreign states and Baghdad not being able to create a national narrative, a patriotic narrative that includes all of Iraq is going to prove to be very, very damaging. Now, do the youth in Baghdad or in the South, do they, do they mean this intentionally? We cannot really blame them. If Iraq has never really had a national reconciliation um, conversation, we've never had that dialogue. People are now using the hashtag end impunity. Impunity was ended the moment the state of Iraq was created. One of the first massacres was against the Assyrians in Minoa. And the vast majority of Iraqis don't even know about this. Uh, when, as Omar was saying, when people talk about Muslim, for example, they talk about the Ezebi genocide, and they think it happened in Mosul when it happened in Sinjar, because very few Iraqis understand the complexities of Minoa. There's a generalization that think because the majority of Muslim or of Minoa are Sunni Arabs, they have to be similar to Anbar or Salah Haddin. Whereas if you look at the demographic of Muslim throughout history, of Minoa throughout history, the most diverse place in Iraq, um, if you grew up in Muslim, it would be very normal to see a, a church almost every, in every mosque, there was a church corresponding to it. The site of minorities and religious groups and, and um, just the, uh, the, the various and, and the different um, ethnic and religions in Muslim is very, very common. None of this is, is understood. And when the, if this was understood, probably we could, they could understand and see how the concept of ISIS was so foreign in its military state and how it does not absolutely represent everyone. So what are Muslawi youth doing? What are the activists doing? Are they trying to include themselves in this movement? They're not. And for one reason, they're trying to protect the movement that's in Baghdad and the South. They know the moment that they are included and they say, hey, we support the October protest. We want to be a part of this. It will be immediately slandered. And uh, as an ISIS affiliate or as Baathist trying to regain the narrative and they want to they want to prevent that from happening because they don't want their brothers and sisters in Baghdad and Basra having to face the same, the same fate. That's already happening to them. So that's one of the reasons that the activism is going to be very, very hard. But you have youth, you have a, a growing generation that has experienced war, a horrific, horrific war, probably one of the largest scales of urban warfare in modern history. Uh, they lived through that. They are energetic. They do want to change. There's no outlet for them to change. There's no leeway for them. So you hear, you see very promising individuals um, focusing on art, focusing on trying their best to create startups. Um, but that's, all, that's, that's about it. It's not collective in a form where we can say it's an actual movement. There's also economic hardships. Most of the people that, uh, the youth that can participate in these activities, they're from the middle or upper class. They have the financial means supported by families that are relatively wealthy, but we're not looking at the others who don't have these, these means. Unemployment is, I would not even say unemployment is high. Employment is almost non-existent in the city, um, whether it's public employment or opportunity to, or the opportunities in the private sector. They're almost um, they're completely, it's, it's been wiped out. The few opportunities that are, are available, you have the, um, certain militias that are affiliated with the popular mobilization forces, taking a book right out of, um, a chapter right out of ISIS's book in uh, extortion and in racket money. So there's very little profit, very little money to be earned because most of it is going, most of it is being paid to these groups. How, how this is going to play out in the future, it's anyone's guess, but one fact is that it's not sustainable. And we've seen what being, being in a situation of an instability and um, a fractured community and fractured city, it cannot hold for too long before something happens. There, are, there is an, a political escalation, even a military escalation happening in the north. It is very close to most of the city. And there might be some ramifications that we might feel um, about this. But as Omar was mentioning, because there's no political life in the city and um, it's very, very hard for youth who are not affiliated with the PMF or not affiliated 
with um, the Tamis al Khanjar and Ahmed al Halbusi sort of blocks of politicians, it's very hard for them to break through, almost impossible. So, with, with the lack of political will and, um, and political representation, Mosul will have no say in its future. Um, it's going to be basically a future of, of compromise between these groups. Um, when Turkey is, and it absolutely will have more of a more of a role in the future. When that comes, it's going to be a negotiations between groups that are not related to the city itself. Um, and it's just how the youth will react to that. Given most of its history for the past, let's say, century, the approach has, has often been passive. So you don't really see an armed resistance in that sense. You don't even see any kind of resistance. It's let's just, let's just wait and see, let's just wait this out. It happened under ISIS, it's happening today. And that most likely will happen um, in the future as well. There will be very little um, to do. People will be fed up. There will be anger. And they will definitely side with the group or with the, with the foreign power that they feel is not trying to eradicate them, not trying to harm them, and the group that will make their life easier. There's an opportunity in front of the Iraqi government and the international community, whether it's on reconstruction, making um, ending corruption or at least combating corruption, giving them a more opportunity to the youth to prevent this from happening. But we see very, very little steps um, being taken. Okay, thank you very much, Rush. And thanks for adding some, some extra details about the, how youth are reacting to the collective action being undertaken by youth in in their own country, but in other areas, and why we're seeing these ruptures, both from both sides, why youth are in Mosul are maybe self-excluding, but why they're also feeling like they're being isolated from those national, broader national uh, movements uh, of youth. Um, and to, to continue this discussion on youth and to draw on the research results that have been undertaken, um, I'm going to turn now to Adel, who's going to, who I think is going to go into more details about these different forms of action and agency of youth in, in Mosul based on the interview that were conducted. Ade? Yeah. Oui, uh, Sarah. Oui, uh, Sarah, merci beaucoup. Merci pour cette... Yes, uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you for having uh, invited me. Uh, thank you for Ari for having organized uh, this uh, webinar, uh, this important webinar. Uh, I just listened to, to uh, the two previous speakers and this was very, very interesting. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, this is uh, similar to what I am going uh, to say in general uh, and uh, I will be talking about very similar uh, similar things. Uh, yes, uh, last year we have uh, conducted a research project, uh, one about Mosul, so the province, the governorate, not only the town, about uh, Mosul in general, uh, and uh, about uh, Nineveh, in addition to Basra. Uh, so we have conducted uh, these two projects. We had 75 uh, uh, meetings or interviews, detailed interviews. Uh, uh, we have spent uh, more than 200 hours uh, uh, working uh, with these uh, uh, interviewees. We've talked uh, about different uh, things. Uh, so uh, gender, uh, uh, people uh, from the different gender identities, uh, uh, different ages, age categories, uh, professional expertise, family status, uh, so a great, great diversity of interviewees. Uh, and we wanted to have uh, interviews from various backgrounds. Uh, and we conducted interviews with all of these uh, persons and uh, we've analyzed uh, these 225 hours of interviews. So you can imagine how rich uh, these interviews were uh, after we, we had spent uh, all these hours uh, uh, talking to these people. We know uh, that uh, we, work, uh, we worked on risky grounds. Yes, uh, there were some journalists uh, that risked their lives uh, to go uh, uh, do, uh, to, to do their job on the ground. We know how many people were assassinated, how many uh, disappeared as well, how many were uh, abducted or kidnapped uh, between October and December 2019, uh, around 600 persons, the young persons uh, died during the protests. Uh, uh, there were 
23 to 25,000 wounded, uh, a great number of, uh, of displaced. Uh, so it was uh, uh, a, a high risk work, if we could say so in this high risk area and uh, for researchers uh, to go uh, to uh, and work on the ground uh, this was not uh, easy at all and but however we had uh, the great chance of visiting Nineveh and uh, Basra uh, and we had the chance uh, to interview these 75 young people more than 225 hours of uh, interviews as I said and um, uh, this is why we had a very rich material it is very important to understand what's happening on the ground, hence the importance of analyzing these interviews. So either uh, uh, people are uh, very attracted towards the reality, towards the now and the here, um, uh, uh, either we sit in it, uh, behind our desks in Washington, in Paris, in New York, and we talk about the political reality, about, uh, um, and we use various uh, communication means to analyze the reality. So there are uh, two, um, uh, two approaches, if you could say so. However, we had the great chance of having face-to-face -face interviews with people on the ground, not through uh, phone conversations and not through Zoom meetings. So we had the chance of going to the ground, uh, of meeting people face-to-face. -face. We had people sitting in front of us, hence the importance of all these interviews that we had uh, conducted. I will try to be as brief as possible since I have only 10 to 15 minutes and I think I've already talked uh, for around four or five minutes anyway i would like to talk about the five uh, uh, main uh, five main indicators or markups uh, that we were able uh, to um, uh, to analyze or to notice uh, I will be talking mainly about Mosul and Nineveh, not about uh, the interviews that we had conducted in uh, Basra. These uh, interviews were extremely important as well because it was very important to understand the dynamics uh, uh, among the young people in Basra, and in Basra and in Mosul and Nineveh. And whenever we analyze these interviews, we notice uh, how much similarities uh, sometimes there are between young people and young groups in these uh, two regions. So uh, the first indicator uh, or marker, if you could say so, that uh, truly hit me was related to uh, the discourse or to the narratives. Uh, uh, there are uh, macro uh, narratives and micro uh, narratives. Uh, uh, there is this transformation, uh, this uh, configuration, if you could say so, reconfiguration, if you could say so. Young people in uh, uh, Mosul uh, do not really dream uh, of uh, macro discourses or narratives uh, uh, na uh, of this uh, nationalism or tribalism or jihadism or terrorism narratives or this ism narratives, these macro narratives, these macro discourses do not attract uh, young uh, uh, people uh, anymore. Uh, before, um, uh, many generations were attracted towards uh, these narratives. However, young people now uh, stress on micro narratives, micro uh, discourses, uh, uh, my uh, my music, uh, my house, I want to become an actor, uh, I want uh, to do this, I want to, to find a job, I want this, I want that. So we've noticed micro uh, discourses and not macro discourses among uh, young, uh, young, uh, uh, young people. Yes, uh, um, this is related to the reality on the ground, but this is related to a part of the reality. So we've noticed uh, um, individualistic, if you could say so, or personalize the discourses, micro discourses rather than macro discourses. Uh, young people talk about what they want. People uh, stress on, um, or young people stress on their individual life, uh, on their everyday life, on what they want uh, 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 in their everyday life. Uh, in order to promote their well-being rather than being attracted to work uh, macro uh, big discourses uh, narratives we've noticed that among arab skirts sunnis uh, shias uh, young men young women uh, Christians, uh, uh, Kaka'i, Yazidis, we've noticed that uh, collectively as if there's a consensus uh, here. The second indicator or the second marker, and it truly hit me to notice uh, that, as you know, Iraq in 2003, 
include the 24 or 25 uh, million, uh, I guess, uh, people now that are uh, 40 million, uh, uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So amidst uh, this uh, context, uh, young people interviewed in Nineveh uh, sense or felt uh, uh, that uh, um, uh, they were um, uh, they weren't attracted anymore uh, by the marriage institution uh, whenever I asked them do you want to get married and have kids and the reaction was Ula, no uh, this is not what we're thinking about uh, now as if this is absolutely not the right moment we're not ready uh, I'm not ready uh, uh, not now uh, it's not the right moment uh, so they, they, they're not attracted to towards this marriage institution. However, when you talk about, and when, uh, when, you, when you talk about uh, uh, children as well, we notice uh, how their vision, how their perception uh, have, uh, have changed. Uh, and um, this uh, will have repercussions for the future. Uh, this is not uh, the case of young people in Basra. So when I asked about marriage in Basra, uh, young people talked about, yes, why not uh, now have children? Yes, they do think about that. Uh, even among young people in Basra, they were engaged or they participated in the protests and the protest movements. But at the same time, they are willing to get married. They are willing to get uh, to have children. However, in Mosul, this is not the case. Young people do not dream of getting married, of having children. They think that uh, they're um, quite far away from that reality now. And this is a very important uh, topic to mention. This is very uh, important for the future of society. The third indicator or marker uh, is uh, uh, quite uh, important as well. This is related to the identity. Uh, of uh, the new uh, generation, post Daesh, uh, post ISIS generation, uh, these young uh, uh, people reject violence completely. They reject all forms of violence, tribal, tribal, uh, uh, state, uh, uh, nationalist violence, uh, violence, um, uh, militia-related violence, family violence. These young people reject all forms of violence. And this is uh, uh, very important. Uh, young people uh, uh, embrace uh, uh, the living together, the peaceful uh, living together in the society, in the community, uh, uh, communication, dialogue, uh, communication challenge, rather than talk about uh, uh, militarization or uh, uh, militias or uh, weapons or the use of weapons. And uh, they reject all these trends. Uh, this explains uh, uh, why uh, they are not committed uh, uh, or not really engaged. I'm not talking about the disengagement. No, I'm talking about not being fully engaged or not being fully committed uh, to uh, so young people who are, that are not fully uh, engaged or fully committed, if you could say so, in the protest uh, movement, uh, the current protest movement. There are uh, many uh, reasons behind uh, this, uh, um, if we could say so, lack of commitment or lack of complete engagement or participation uh, in uh, the protest. Uh, why? Because they fear uh, violence. So I'm not committing to, uh, uh, to uh, participate in the protest movement, but I do not condemn the protest movement. Why I do not participate? Because I see in front of me militias that are armed. Uh, there is a state that is taken hostage by the militias and there is a state at the same time uh, that isn't reluctant uh, or that doesn't hesitate uh, to use all the tools or the beans um, uh, that can lead to violence in the protest movement since I as a young man reject violence I do not commit to participating to these protest movements but I do not condemn these protest movements so since they think that there might be violence in these movements since young people reject violence completely, um, they'd rather take their distance uh, uh, regarding the protest movement and they'd rather not participate fully in these protest movements. Fourth indicator, fourth marker and very important marker, uh, it's uh, this, uh, uh, um, uh, if we could say so, um, uh, challenge. Uh, this uh, 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 
rupture, uh, if we uh, could say so, with the ruling category, with the ruling, uh, ruling power. So 95% uh, of the young interviewees do not uh, trust any of the elites, neither Sunni nor Shia, nor Kurds, nor uh, Muslim, nor Christian. So they do not trust uh, uh, these leaders, these elites, uh, uh, as if uh, everything is done for them, uh, as if uh, uh, everything, uh, or as if they uh, lost their faith in them. So now uh, uh, they have put an X, if you could say so, uh, on these elites, on these leaders. Uh, this led to the Despair, uh, and uh, uh, now they're talking about rebuilding uh, their future, their country. Uh, they talk about uh, 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 unemployment, about having uh, perspectives, better perspectives for the future. Uh, but uh, uh, we, as young people, do not want to participate in any violence, uh, violent movement. Uh, uh, but we do want a better future. Uh, so uh, this is something quite recurrent, if you could say so, in the interviews uh, uh, with all. Uh, young people from different backgrounds, different confessions, different sects, different affiliations. Uh, and uh, this is an indicator that was quite common uh, among uh, uh, young people in Mosul. However, this indicator might not be the same in the southern part of the country in Basra. There might be another discourse when we might have the opportunity to talk about that in other webinars, because in Basra, there are some young people that support uh, some militias that support the government, uh, some young people uh, in Basra uh, that think that the only strategy to change things in Iraq is uh, be committed and is being engaged in a revolutionary movement. So uh, they embrace uh, some uh, violent uh, uh, movements. They do not have a problem with, with that, unlike young people in Mosul. So we, we notice uh, this different discourse. One last element, one last indicator. I still have one minute, Sarah, right? So one, so one last element, which is as important as the other four elements, it is uh, uh, the desire uh, to have social and societal inclusion, not through politics. Uh, so uh, they're done with uh, with politics uh, in, uh, in in that region. Uh, they uh, think that only demons uh, or that uh, politics is only for demons. However, they talk about social integration and societal integration through uh, employment, through work as if everyone agreed on that, everyone agreed uh, on the importance of employment, uh, uh, and they did not talk about one sector, one domain, they, they talked about uh, the necessity, the importance of having a place in the economic sector, a place in the economic system, and it is this employment that will give me, as a young man, as a young woman, this identity. This is a marker and, uh, that is very important and uh, an indicator that is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adil, and thank you, uh, you know, for bringing out the different elements here, not just the political elements, but also things in terms of personal life, marriage, uh, the importance of employment as the vector for social, for social integration. Um, I think that especially, you know, the, this difference in terms of marriage and the perspective of family life between youth in Mosul and in Basra is um, this very interesting research result and hope in the chat we'll have time to go more into that and your, your theories for why that is. And then finally, we'll turn to uh, Miriam. Uh, thank you, Sarah, um, and thank you to everyone who was involved in organizing this um, webinar. Um, it's really a privilege to be here and to be part of such a great panel. Um, I was asked specifically to speak about uh, minorities on political agency in the uh, post-ISIS period um, in Mosul and in northern Iraq. And so I'm going to be look, taking a little bit of a, a step back uh, from Mosul itself, because as the others have already alluded to, um, there has been a process of displacement of minorities from Mosul, and many of those um, uh, communities have not uh, yet returned or might not return. And so a lot of the kind of political dynamics that are taking place in those communities now are not necessarily centered um, in the city of Mosul, but in other parts of Nenawa and also in the locations of displacement. Um, 
And I want to preface this all by saying that uh, Iraq's minorities are numerous and their experiences are very diverse and varied. Their experiences under ISIS have also varied considerably, uh, and so do their outlooks towards the future. Um, and I think there's often a tendency um, when speaking about minorities, um, especially from outside of Iraq, uh, to deal with them as homogenous blocks and to paint their experiences, um, especially since the rise of ISIS in a very generalized or even essentialized way. Um, and so I'm not going to be able to cover the diversity of minority experiences and perspectives in the space of 10 or 15 minutes. But what I intend to do is offer a few reflections and examples about how uh, minorities have mobilized and organized in the post ISIS context. And uh, I'll be looking particularly at uh, rights based activism as one facet of political agency. And uh, before I get into that, I'll maybe just say a few words about ceasefire and the work that we do just to provide a little context to what I'm saying. Um, so ceasefire, the ceasefire Center for Civilian Rights is an international initiative based uh, in London, but we work in a number of conflict situations around the world, including Iraq. And uh, much of our work over the years has been geared towards um, building what we refer to as civilian led monitoring of violations of human rights and also international humanitarian law. Um, so that means moving away from the kind of traditional practice of human rights monitoring, which has been primarily the domain of um, so called expert bodies and institutions, whether that's UN mechanisms, whether that's uh, fact finding missions um, or international human rights organizations. Um, so our work is really about putting the work of documentation, taking it out of the hands of experts and into the hands um, of ordinary civilians who are themselves directly affected by conflict and promoting their role um, in shaping their, their narratives and their demands for, for justice. Um, and so our work in Iraq over the years um, has involved a lot of training for activists from across the country, um, training them in human rights standards and monitoring practices to enable them to produce a credible documentation of violations. Um, and then also providing support to civil society led initiatives involved in rights based advocacy, whether that's at the community or local or national level. And that has also involved work with a number of minority activists and minority led civil society organizations over the years. Um, so if I can just provide a few general reflections about the situation of minorities kind of before and after the ISIS takeover of Mosul. Um, on the one hand, the marginalization of Iraqi minorities, of course, did not begin with ISIS. Um, it has much deeper roots, going back not just to the upheaval caused by the 2003 US-led invasion, but also a much, much longer history before that. Um, and if we look at Mosul in particular, uh, minorities had actually been leaving Mosul and other Iraqi cities for many years. Um, and as one example, at Mosul University, there were a series of um, violent attacks targeting religious minorities, even in the years prior to the ISIS advance, which led um, thousands of EZD students in particular to terminate their studies there. Um, so the climate in the city was um, becoming increasingly unsafe for minorities um, as a kind of result of the um, overall political marginalization and um, patterns of um, disillusionment that were taking place in Iraq um, in the post-invasion context. Um, so with all of that being said, the rise of ISIS still was without doubt a dramatic uh, turning point. And for some, it was the last straw. Um, the ISIS advance created a massive new wave of displacement of minorities from Iraq and led to the uprooting of entire communities from their historical homelands in and around Mosul and in the Nineveh Plains, Sinjar. Um, and this was combined with atrocities targeted at uh, minorities, including mass killings, sexual violence, um, and the destruction of cultural and religious heritage. Um, but when speaking about minorities in the context of ISIS, there's often this overarching narrative of um, extinction, of persecution, of despair, of hopelessness, uh, which is not to detract from the existential threat that minorities have faced, but just to say that to always portray a minority solely through this lens um, can be very disempowering. And it puts minorities in a perpetual state of victimhood um, that deals with them as groups in need of protection rather than as individual agents of change 
or as citizens deserving of equal rights. Uh, we released a report last year about Mosul, and it looked particularly at civilians' attitudes towards reparation uh, or compensation as a tool to begin uh, recovering from the conflict in the city. Uh, and we found that despite the enormous scale of the destruction inflicted on Mosul, uh, many people felt a strong sense of attachment to the city, to their family history there, um, to its legacy of diversity, and were eager to return and rebuild their houses. Um, and rebuilding was not just about um, the, the buildings itself, it was about restoring dignity. Um, and in the case of destroyed religious and cultural sites, it was also about restoring Mosul's historical diversity, about healing the ruptures in the social and cultural fabric that were caused by the ISIS occupation, and about sending a strong signal that life in the city would return and that minorities are a part of that life. So to quote a few interviewees from the report, uh, we had people express sentiments like, uh, there is no dignity outside of my land, or I want to die in my house, not on someone else's doorstep. Um, and in the words of one um, interviewee who was insistent on returning to Mosul um, just a few weeks after the military campaign to retake the city was concluded, um, he said, I don't belong in Baghdad, I come from Mosul, and if all the citizens of Mosul don't come back to rebuild the city, then who will do it? So despite you know, the, the widespread nature of the destruction and the disillusionment, there is still very much this, this idea of, of belonging and of uh, a wish to rebuild and to, and to return and to, um, to return to the place of one's roots. Um, so turning now to the idea of, of rights-based activism and particularly uh, minority rights, um, uh, minority rights activism. Um, although the ISIS advance um, caused indescribable, as we've mentioned, destruction and, and suffering, it was also in a way an impetus for change. Uh, things came to a breaking point where people could no longer accept the status quo. Um, and the rise of a group like ISIS itself um, could be seen as the ultimate product of an exclusionary uh, political order that for many years had failed to provide civil, political, economic, and social rights for Iraqis on an equal basis. So the deep damage caused by the conflict with ISIS has in a way served to embolden not only minorities, but Iraqis in general to demand a better future because the old, the old system is simply not sustainable. So I think we can point to a few trends in uh, rights-based activism since the rise of ISIS. And one has been the emergence of a new generation of civil society organizations and activists. Um, for minorities in particular, the ISIS advance showed that they could not depend on anyone else for their protection. Um, there was disappointment in the federal government, but also the Kurdistan regional government, the Peshmerga, the Iraqi security forces, all of which um, failed ultimately to, to protect minorities from the advance of ISIS. Um, so many new organizations were born out of necessity, out of a need to respond to this crisis. Um, many people who did not necessarily see themselves as activists were suddenly propelled into the role of activists when their community suddenly came under, the, came under attack. Um, and many of these activists started to articulate demands for their communities independently of existing structures. Um, so whether there was a tendency to deal with minorities as religious blocks or to treat their religious leaders as speaking for the community of the whole, as a whole, um, we've increasingly seen a, a diversification of, of voices who, um, who speak for the community. And <clears throat> That brings me to um, the second trend, which has been a disruption and challenging of social norms in terms of who speaks for the community, um, as seen in particular in the emergence of a new generation of female activists. Um, and I'm thinking in particular of uh, the outspoken survivors of sexual violence from the Yazidi community. So you have activists like Nadia Murad, who is perhaps one of the most well-known voices um, internationally, but there are many, many others like her um, in Iraq, uh, women and girls who have discarded the notion that a survivor of sexual violence should be ashamed or be silent about what they've been through. And again, many of these women and girls do not have a history of activism or of public speaking, but they have come to articulate a set of 
like coherent demands and to advocate for the communities locally, nationally, and even internationally. And this new activism has been accompanied by an increasingly public role for Yazidi women in other spheres as well. And this is partially a, a product of the sad reality that many men and boys from the community were killed in the genocide. Women lost their, in some cases, all their male relatives, the breadwinners, the heads of the household. And this has uh, driven or actually forced many women to consider working outside the home for the first time, uh, pursuing an education and building uh, new lives for themselves. Uh, another trend we can point to is um, international and transnational networking and action. Um, the ISIS advance certainly put the plight of Iraqi minorities under the international spotlight. Um, and this has translated into an increase in international support and funding for minorities and the organizations representing them. And they've often be able to, been able to leverage that support and use it to strengthen uh, their own negotiating position vis-a-vis -vis a government that had long marginalized them. And so a recent example of this joint advocacy and organization um, between local and international NGOs um, can be seen in the adoption of the Yazidi Survivors Law um, in the Iraqi parliament in March 2021, so just a few months ago. Um, and this law is quite remarkable in a number of ways. It was the first law that um, explicitly recognized that ISIS had committed genocide. Um, the first law in Iraq to provide um, compensation and various other forms of reparation to survivors of sexual violence. Um, and the advocacy and organizing of um, civil society groups led to the um, provisions of the law being extended not only to Yazidi survivors, but also explicitly to uh, Christian, Shabaki, and Turkmani women as well who suffered, who also suffered um, sexual violence at the hands of ISIS. Um, so this is kind of a, a, a concrete um, example of how um, minorities, uh, communities affected by ISIS have um, engaged in organizing um, towards joint demands with, with international support as well. And as another example of in the international dimension, I would also point to um, the fact that diaspora groups um, have played a very active role in drawing attention to uh, violations against minorities in Iraq and pressuring their own governments to act. And uh, lastly, um, I would also point, um, this is a similar point, but um, drawing attention to the solidarity and joint organizing between different uh, minority communities. Uh, I think the ISIS advance um, kind of led to a perception of uh, a common experience and a common cause of being um, targeted uh, for the for the for the reason of your identity, and this has led to the articulation of demands that are not only about the protection of one particular community or another, but for an Iraq which exp with which respects everyone's rights. Um, and here I would also point to the ways in which the demands of minorities in some ways coalesce with wider um, social and political movements taking place in Iraq. Um, Omar and Russia have already pointed to um, the emergence of widespread protest movements um, since the defeat of ISIS and um, the notable um, fact that these protests erupted um, not in the conflict affected governorates, not in the north, but in uh, the south and in primarily um, Shia populated towns and governorates. Um, and yet um, the protest movements express a rejection of the political system in Iraq as one that engenders sectarianism, uh, corruption, nepotism, and that has failed to provide uh, public services and opportunities that meet the aspirations of young Iraqis. And so in many ways, this is a rejection of the same system that uh, has also marginalized uh, minorities since 2003. And despite the fact that uh, minorities were perhaps not central actors in the protests themselves, um, there have been um, several expressions of solidarity from, uh, from minority communities in the North with the events that were taking place in the South. Um, so for example, um, the Chaldean Patriarchate canceling Christmas and New Year celebrations um, in December, 2019, out of respect for the protesters who were killed um, in the demonstrations. Uh, similar initiatives from Yazidi and Mundane religious leadership. 
um, and expressions of solidarity from um, activists from various minority backgrounds in the north, um, expressing their um, support for, for the demands of the protests in the south. So um, I think I, I'll kind of wrap it up there. Of course, um, as I alluded to in the beginning, what I've, uh, what I've illustrated here are a few um, illustrations of, um, of activism, of mobilization, but of course that's not to paint uh, a picture of universal you know, optimism or universal um, um, you know, hope for the future. Of course, there's also simultaneously a lot of cynicism, a lot of pessimism, a lot of long-term problems that have not been solved um, you know, seven years after the, the fall of Mosul. Um, many, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people still living in IDB camps, not sure if they can return, um, afraid to return, the status of their area still being um, subject to political and security um, uh, uh, negotiations between the parties in power. And of course, there's still the question of how successful will a protest movement ever be against um, you know, such a configuration of political and economic and um, security powers that are in control of, of, of the political um, landscape in Iraq. But um, what I hope to do is just kind of add some uh, nuance to the, um, to the portrayal of, of, of minorities in particular and to show that there is, um, alongside this pessimism, there is also uh, a very concentrated um, uh, effort to be agents of change and to and to ask for something better than what um, Iraqis have um, have had to deal, deal with so far. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miriam, and thank you for you know for highlighting um, these pockets of of activism and of and really new ways of even conceiving of of rights and of belonging. And I think you know comparing the different presentations. Um, what's in, you know, several things that are sort of threads that are in common across them. I mean, there's, I think you're all alluding to this breakdown in both the concept of national identity, these feelings of national belonging, but also in the model itself and the way the entire political order was set up that this is no longer considered a viable or legitimate political order for various reasons. And these reasons might not be exactly identical across different groups, but we are seeing this convergence of this idea that the model that was put forth that Baghdad is not in a position anymore to put forth a national identity or model that is legitimate and that can bring people all together under it. And there's also, I think, very interesting competing dynamics that you all are bringing out between the feeling of collective guilt and this pressure to acknowledge or to prove innocence, this burden of proving innocence that is felt by some, versus what you were bringing up, Miriam, that this there is a degree of international support for other groups, that there are very competing ways in which we are viewing people from this city, from this region and their status. Um, and that is, I would imagine creating um, points of friction in certain areas. Um, and the way we are viewing the population is actually can be quite different in the type of support they're receiving. I mean, even for what you were saying, Rasha, that even as someone not living in Iraq, you have to have this burden of innocence um, in order to even be invited or be legitimately accepted as a researcher. You know, we're having, we see very, very different ways in which this post uh, ISIS period is affecting people in their own personal lives and how they're being viewed um, in their city and in their national and international context. Um, I'm going to open the floor. I see there's quite a number of questions coming in. We've got about 25 minutes. Uh, so I am going to open I'm going to go through these questions a little bit here um, and see if ones have already been answered. I think some have actually already come out in the discussion, so I'll try to either reframe them or, or, or you know, see what, what are some of the new things that are coming out. Um, but there's a question here about, um, there's a broader set of questions actually about uh, the question of uh, the rise of ISIS and if this can come about again. I know that there has been a little bit of discussion about that already, but I do think that's probably something that's quite interesting to a lot of people is, um, you know, are we seeing a situation in which various factors are in place that could allow this, whether this is um, sort of the breakdown in social cohesion uh, or, um, you know, the, the, the way the central government is treating prisoners or, or things like this? Do we see that there's a possibility for this for ISIS to come back or not? 
and I'll, this will be open to all the panelists. Um, I, I can give a, a very brief answer. So the Islamic State and al-Jihadist group, um, they will exploit any opportunity to make themselves visible. So whatever they can to create chaos, to say, hey, look, we're still here, to wave that banner when they can, they will take it. Um, can we expect a surge as, as in Mosul, like similar to 2014? Highly unlikely. Nonetheless, because there are these vacancies, there are these vacuums, sorry, there are in, in security, also, as you mentioned, in, um, uh, among refugee camps, among IDP camps, because these vacuums do exist, they can, they, they absolutely will at some point. We might hear of an explosion, a kidnap, an extortion, um, an attempted attack on forces, um, regaining the entire city or even parts of it uh, under their control, under the Islamic State. That is part of history now. That would not happen again. The recruitment process for them, um, if we look at it, if we look at the circumstances in the city today, we would think that recruitment would be very easy because of the uh, factors that you just mentioned. However, they have not been able to add new blood into their organization because as Adil mentioned, and also Miriam as well, Amr alluded to it uh, too, people are fed up with it. The violence they experienced in extremely damaging war. Uh, so ISIS as we know it, that will not happen. This is both good and bad. It's good because of course, no one wants a caliph again. No one wants to experience that. It has a bad side is because when there is no caliph on that pulpit in Muslim uh, preaching, no one cares. So the underground insurgency, it can, it can develop, it can reach a certain level, which causes enough havoc and damage and chaos to the people, but without any international intervention, without even any government or local, um, even any attention from Baghdad, it would not probably, you, you won't even hear about it in the news. And minorities will be the first target, women will also be the first target, but it would be so, it would be considered marginalized and just part of the violence, the nonstop cycle of violence in Iraq in general, and not looked at as a part of an ISIS insurgency. So that's the negative part of it. I hope that answers. If, if I may add something, Sarah, uh, your, your last, your last uh, remark on the uh, central government of Iraq is that it is no more able to produce any kind of sense to every Iraqi, not just in the north. Uh, uh, it's in, in, in it's what, what they call it that it's their house, the southern part of Iraq. It is where the Iraqi government uh, mostly rely on, 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 on its people. Those people are rejecting this government. Uh, when you don't have such a government or political order or a system that can produce the sense of the of belonging, the sense of protection, the feeling that you are as equal as any other citizen. And with the growth of the, of course, I am with, with, with all the rights of the minorities, but with the growth of the Western approach toward the Iraqi communities, treating them as uh, 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 portions, as uh, groups, not as uh, 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 collective communities, I believe that whether it's ISIS or not, there will be more violence in Iraq. And that's the most scary scenario that the violence is going to be the result of the current uh, political fail, uh, failure in, in, in Iraq. There will be a point when the communities will see that there is no exit. There is no way to exit this uh, pressure, but the violence because the uh, uh, political problems in Iraq are very radical and there will be no way to respond to them but in a radical response. And we have seen how the uh, security forces in Southern Iraq are uh, treating the, uh, uh, the people in the streets. Not to mention how the demographic change that is happening in Northern Iraq, whether in Nineveh Plains, for example, where the Nineveh Plains is supposed to be again, a safe heaven for those uh, minorities who have escaped the violence. It is being, again, under the pressure of the uh, militias who are taking their lands, who are uh, dividing the huge farms into uh, small uh, pieces to uh, be used for housing for people who are supporting the militias, 
We have the problem of Sinjar that is becoming at the heart of the regional conflict. Uh, uh, again, it's it's it's. I, I believe that the question that we should uh, ask in the in the future is not whether Daesh will be able to re-emerge or not. The question is, will this violence ever end? Will this violence ever uh, 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 see uh, uh, an end? In my opinion, and based on the uh, factors on the ground, uh, the violence is reshaping itself and it's becoming more organized. Uh, uh, the Iraqi government will no more be able to address any of these issues. And the uh, people, especially uh, uh, those who feel that they are targeted, not represented by the uh, uh, political uh, system, they will see that there is no way to respond to such uh, uh, injustice, but through violence. And I would maybe just add on to that. Um, Russia and Omar already spoke before about the idea of um, collective responsibility and, and collective punishment. And um, I would say that this, um, this idea of collective punishment is not simply something that exists at the level of perception or the level of community or uh, at the social level, but it's also a matter of policy in terms of the way that the government has dealt with the question of justice and accountability for the violations that took place um, during the ISIS period. So you have um, trials of, uh, of, of people who are suspected of ISIS affiliation that uh, don't meet basic standards of justice, that rely on confessions extracted through torture, through anonymous um, testimonies, and that treat um, anyone who has any sort of perceived affiliation with ISIS, whether they were actually responsible for violations or whether they were, uh, you know, a driver or or even a wife or a family member of an ISIS member are all being treated as, as criminals and being um, sentenced or otherwise treated very harshly in the system. And this is definitely engendering uh, even more disillusionment and, and, and distrust um, of the state. Um, and um, I think what I also wanted to say was that um, uh, I've, I'll leave it there. <laughs> I had another point, but I lost it. So I think we can move on to the next question. Okay, thank Sarah, you. Sarah, I have uh, something uh, to add regarding uh, Daesh. Regarding Daesh, very briefly, Al Qaeda. Uh, the resistance first, 2003, 2006. After that, Al Qaeda and Al Qaeda violence. Uh, after that, uh, Daesh. Uh, so uh, we might see after that other groups. It's not about the form, but rather about the repercussions, the aftermath. What are the root causes? Ever since 2003, there were many conditions, many causes that led to the situation political, social, economic. Uh, uh, conditions, uh, cultural uh, reasons, historic uh, reasons that led to the status quo. Uh, this is what led to the resistance. This is what led to Al Qaeda. This is what led to Daesh. And tomorrow there might be other organizations, other groups. Uh, um, violence has never disappeared. Uh, uh, in uh, uh, 2017, Abadi uh, appeared with uh, Macron at the Elysee, uh, and uh, they had talked about the end of Daesh. However, this did not end. What ended is uh, uh, the polarization of Daesh or uh, the impact of Daesh, uh, perhaps uh, geographically on the ground. For the first time, we have seen we had seen a group like Daesh that was controlling some parts of uh, uh, of the country, uh, some territories. Um, and what Abadi talked about is the end of Daesh control uh, over uh, uh, in 2007. Sorry, what uh, we can talk about uh, is uh, this end of uh, Daesh control over these territories. But there is still this militant uh, gr uh, ground, this militant foundation, uh, and all the condition, all the conditions that led to the emergence of ISIS, all the conditions that led to the emergence. I'm repeating of Daesh are still present, the pillars are still present, the foundations are still present, and things are even worse. These foundations are even more strengthened, even more powerful. 
the Iraqi state suffers from at least 10 uh, diseases, at least 10 diseases, and these diseases uh, will not be treated or tackled in the uh, few coming years, and this violence will probably not disappear anytime soon. This violence, as we can notice, is increasing at the national Iraqi level. It is massively growing. This violence is massively growing across the country. Thank you very much. Um, we have some other questions regarding uh, the uh, various things related to electoral politics, actually. There's a question uh, related to uh, Anbar province, Anbar, under Helbusi, and if this might be uh, a possible future for Mosul if Helbusi were to win the elections. Well, uh, if, if Helbusi take over Mosul, so this is another end to Mosul. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, it will be a disaster if Mosul will be under the uh, domination or control of uh, uh, Halbusi. Uh, the way, uh, the way he, the, the, his political approach toward Mosul is terrifying. Uh, it's as terrifying as the uh, Iran-backed militias, to be honest. Okay, there's also a question coming in about the Ba'ath Party um, and what is the role in the Ba'ath Party of the Ba'ath Party today um, in terms of the violence that's being exercised or uh, political instability? This, this should be a very old question. It should no more be on the table. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, that, that, you know, this just confirms literally everything I spoke about and Omar spoke about earlier. The fact that Mosul is still associated with the Ba'ath Party, the fact that this question is even being asked just proves the stereotype. Um, the Ba'ath Party does not, has not existed in Mosul for a long time. If there were small remnants of the Ba'ath Party that they either, some of them joined ISIS in the, at the leadership level, that's a fact, um, but the vast majority of them were either executed or killed or also expelled by, by ISIS. The Ba'athists, the few of them that are in diaspora and are that are still active, they have no influence in the city. Mosul in general, historically, um, was, yes, a military city, but Amr could confirm this. It was never a hardcore Ba'athist city. I don't really understand where the stereotype came from. Mosul is a conservative city. It had elements of Islamism and perhaps the Muslim Brotherhood. That is true. But Ba'athists itself, they were not ever the, the, the center or, or not even popular which is why when the city fell um, in 2003, when, when Iraq fell in 2003, the regime change happened. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood groups, the Islamic party in Muslim was the first one of the first groups to organize itself. If that is anything, it's a reflection of the nature of, at the time of, of the city. So, but to answer that question, I don't believe they have any impact or any influence. The violence today in, in Iraq in general Muslim, if there is any violence, it's not being perpetrated by um, groups. It's basically by the uh, militias that are under the PMF. And then you have ISIS carrying out through its uh, sleeper cells, carrying out attacks. Most of them, most of these attacks are not in Ninua, they are in Kirkuk and in Diyala. Yeah, I think it might even be interesting to look at this question another way. And, and I think a more um, interesting way to phrase it could be what is the um, the, the legacy of debathification in terms of the violence that we're seeing today, because it was, if you if you treat debathification as another example of of collective responsibility, it was a process after two thousand and three that led to a lot of Sunnis being ejected from public positions, from employment, from from the security forces, and having a real lack of opportunities um, to, to earn a living or to participate in public life that drove a lot of people towards armed groups um, and towards um, expressing their demands um, that way. Um, and I think that's definitely something that uh, will also happen uh, again with the way that um, so-called ISIS sympathizers are being treated. And when it even comes to basic things like public services and uh, compensation. If you are uh, from Mosul and your house was destroyed in the, um, in, in the military campaign, uh, 
uh, and you apply for compensation from the Iraqi government. Um, you don't receive compensation until the government has checked that you are not a former member of the Ba'ath Party in its, in its lists. It, it checks the security agency's list to make sure that you are not uh, affiliated with ISIS in, in any way. And we know that there are a lot of problems with these lists uh, in terms of people with similar names or, or relatives of, of, of actual uh, you know, militants being included on these lists as well. So um, even you know, a basic thing like uh, compensation for property damage is being denied to people who have any kind of um, uh, affiliation real or perceived with uh, with these groups and um, that is definitely something that uh, doesn't bode well for the future it's it's even the death certificate Miriam is almost impossible to get from the government even the death certificate okay thank you uh, I think we have probably time for one or two more questions there's a question for Adil on women uh, the, from your the interviews you're doing. I mean, I, the question is about the gender lens regarding the, the views of female uh, interviewees. I, were you finding in your research uh, in reviewing the interviews uh, different types of responses between men and women? Uh, did you see any uh, evidence that women are experiencing, you know, either political opportunities, political engagement, um, or views towards marriage or uh, uh, economic opportunities differently than their male counterparts? Euh, oui, euh, alors, donc, ce qui est extraordinaire, c'est que je, je suis parti avec euh, un préjugé. What is extraordinary is that I had uh, certain um, uh, stereotypes, if I could say so. I have uh, uh, some prejudice in my mind, and all these stereotypes were broken after the interviews. Uh, by definition, uh, in a society that is governed uh, by men, uh, you think uh, that uh, there will be different answers uh, among men and women, that, that perceptions would be different between young men and women, namely in terms of things related to gender. However, this is wrong. This wasn't right at all. When we interviewed these young men and these young women, we have uh, noticed uh, regarding all questions related to uh, work, employment, uh, uh, marriage, uh, reproduction or having kids, both men and women had similar questions. So uh, it was truly striking. Uh, women uh, had uh, uh, even analytic analytical skills that were uh, uh, um, even more developed uh, than uh, uh, women. So no, we did not feel this difference between men and women. Uh, and we did not sense this uh, gap, if we could say so, or this difference between men and women. Whenever we put things into context, into a larger context, we might uh, find some differences, yes. But uh, regarding women that were interviewed in Mosul, we found out uh, that women that had the same perceptions as uh, men, young men regarding uh, marriage, having children, employment, and other uh, topics. Uh, we've noticed as well uh, that uh, certain young women And during uh, uh, the interviews, talked about why they did not want to get married. Women talked in details about the reasons behind them not wanting to get married. They have an entire argumentation, uh, analytical uh, skill. They talk about marriage, about reproduction, about having kids, about uh, uh, why they took this decision, about why they have this percep perception of that. Uh, they talked about uh, wanting employment, wanting a job, about wanting economic stability, wanting to go to Erbil or Soleimaniya, they talked about all these things and they had, uh, so um, they have proven to have a very developed analytical, analytical skills. So sometimes you come with, with certain stereotypes in your mind and these stereotypes are broken whenever you talk to these young men and women on the ground. So uh, their answers were quite similar. Regarding uh, the non-recognition of children born out, born out of violence suffered, uh, and if there's a perception, is this, uh, you know, the, a perception of attachment of these children to ISIS, uh, and are they viewed or are they viewed more as victims? 
Yeah, I think that's an important question. And it was one of the disappointing um, aspects of the passage of that law was that it didn't treat the situation of um, children who were born out of rape. Uh, there was an attempt to include some uh, provisions in the law that it would at least open the door to um, to the civil status of these children being uh, being decided on, but it was eventually um, withdrawn. Um, and partially that was because of a lack of consensus within the Yazidi community themselves on uh, how these children should be dealt with. And there are um, some elements of the community that, that don't want those children um, to be taken in, um, don't want them to be recognized as Yazidis. And partially that is, um, I think, as I think the question was alluding to, um, this, this fear of, of, of ISIS affiliation and of an inability to kind of separate um, the victims of, of, of ISIS from um, from those who are um, kind of associated with the group. Um, but I think it's not only about that. I think it's also the, the question of how to deal with the registration of these children or, or, or the integration of the children also touches upon, um, I think, some of the principles of, of the state and the lack of, of civil avenues for, for things like identity registration um, and the fact that there is uh, no way for a child who is born to is a Yazidi mother to be recognized um, officially as a Yazidi child if the father is, is not Yazidi or if the father is um, assumed to be Muslim. And um, I think uh, kind of agreeing on a, a solution to that or an alternative to that kind of um, challenges the, the way in which the post-2003 state deals with uh, ethnicity and religion and sect. And so it is quite a, uh, a difficult issue that sadly so many years have gone by and there's uh, very little um, consensus on, on what should be done. Sarah, I have something to add. I will be as brief as possible uh, regarding uh, Nineveh. When, and regarding other uh, provinces, other governorates, when we talked to, to women in Basra and Erbil, we've noticed the differences uh, there and gaps there, whether in terms of how uh, women were telling their stories. Uh, 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 Women uh, talked uh, about uh, uh, about uh, the society being uh, ruled or governed by men. Uh, they've talked about how uh, they wanted to be visible in the society. Uh, they said that everything is controlled by men. We live for for uh, we live for men. We live we live by the rules of men. Men are the ones that uh, decide how we live. We do not have enough visibility. Uh, this is how women answered in other governments and provinces and. These women think that uh, protest movements uh, gave them an opportunity to appear more as women in this uh, space. Uh, so we notice uh, this uh, fragmentation, uh, if we could say so, this difference uh, between northern societies and uh, southern societies. And uh, this can be explained uh, uh, if we understand the reality on the ground. Everyone, very much. I don't think we have time to take any more questions because our our wonderful uh, simultaneous translators <laughs> will be signing off in two minutes' time. So I'm just going to go ahead and thank our four panelists. Um, I do want to offer you all, if you have any final remarks you would like to make, I do want to open the floor to you. Just in a few words, uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, I hope I hope that we we'll start reviewing all the way we have been looking at what happened in Mosul. Uh, 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 not as something uh, uh, done by a certain group, a Sunni group, or etc. And also to look at Mosul, not only the small part of the city, it's rather a larger uh, geographical area, and it cannot be disconnected because once we treat it as a, a, a disconnected area, we will uh, miss the uh, uh, reality of what's happening in Mosul. Therefore, we will miss the uh, 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 opportunity to find real solutions because you cannot uh, uh, treat Mosul as a part connected from the rest of the uh, uh, Nineveh uh, region. And by the way, uh, the name Nineveh was given to Mosul only by, uh, this is one of the consequences of the Ba'athis. It was all called Mosul, but the Ba'athis 
change the name from Mosul to Nineveh. And this is also addressing uh, the person who asked about what did the bath uh, do in Mosul. Thank you. Okay, I think I think those are actually very, um, very good parting words to end this conference on the way we need to be thinking about and rethinking about Mosul uh, and its future. Um, and how we need to be expanding our own ways of thinking about this. So I will thank my four, our four speakers today and thank you all for joining us. And as I said, this will be available uh, online within the next few hours, I believe. So thank you all, goodbye. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Bye.